much. Today's passage, this is almost, I mean, it's, it's the Sunday after Easter passage. It, 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 when it comes to like the lectionary, it's Doubting Thomas Sunday. It gets its own name. It's unofficial. It's uh, the, un, the unofficial, unofficial Sunday is Assistant Pastor Sunday. <laughs> Usually the senior pastor is so wiped after uh, Holy Week, time to get a guest preacher in, and the associate or the assistant. We have room to grow, Spirit of Hope. <laughs> That's all I'm trying to say. Uh, no. I do appreciate this passage. If, if you're ever going to have a passage that's used year after year, this is one of them. Because it's got uh, a deep well of symbolism, of meaning. You can go in so many directions. There's so many like kind of, wait, did I hear that right? If you were listening to the passage, the doors were locked, the windows were shut, and yet Jesus emerges among them. What is he, a ghost? Is he like phase into the room like some Marvel superhero? Like, it, how does that happen? Then there's the, he's breathing on them and receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus has been dead for three days. What does that smell like? <laughs> that sounds kind of gross to me. There's, I could, I could, I could, I could go for seven. I could give less, it could be a semester on the, on the command he says to them, shalom. The fact that he's showing them the scars. The fact that he doesn't appear to them except as a group. I mean, deep wells of possible sermon material. But of course, the big bite is doubting Thomas. So the disciples, it's Easter Sunday. It says it's the end of the day of the first day of the week, right? So it's still Easter, more Easter day. And it's at the end of the day that all this happens. Jesus shows up, shows them their hands, scares them because they're like, zombie! No, the hands, feet, side, believe, shalom, peace, breathe on them. And he's out. And for some reason, Judas, or not Judas, Judas wasn't in the room. Thomas wasn't in the room out getting pizza, something, and he comes back. Now Thomas, I, I, of my 14 years, 14 years of being a pastor, I have defended Thomas. One, because he gets a moniker doubting Thomas off his worst day. And if you are going to be known throughout history, do you want to be known throughout history by your worst day? I mean, none of the other disciples get that, like prejudiced Nathaniel. I could go into the whole story there. You know, p denying Peter. Even Judas, he didn't get betrayer Judas. He got a last name, Judas Iscariot. But somehow he's doubting Thomas. And the other reason I defend Th Thomas isn't just because he's being judged by his worst day, but because Thomas seems like a real human being. All the disciples do when you really read the passage, but this, even on a surface level, I can, I can feel with Thomas. Because have you ever not been the one invited to the party? Have you ever not been the one who wasn't at the big game? Let me tell you, the last time, oh, this isn't in the sermon, the last time when you 2 you know the band U2? Give me some head nods. They were in Minnesota. They played. And it's the outdoor stadium. And it started to rain during like the key moment. And I swear every Methodist pastor was there except me. Because they're like, it's a deeply spiritual experience. It was like, we're all one. And it was like, yeah. And I'm like, just shut up. <laughs> no, it wasn't that big of a spiritual experience. If I didn't feel the rain on my face, it, doesn't, it didn't really happen. I'm spiritual, but I could be petty at any given moment. <laughs> so I feel for Thomas. He only wants what the others got. Everybody else who'd been following Jesus for the last three and a half years got to see him. Everybody else who saw him die on the cross are saying, hey, the resurrection actually happened. And he 
he didn't. And I can also feel for that because I've had people tell me like miracles that God, I wish would have happened for me. And because they didn't happen to me, I have a level of skepticism and a harshness towards the good news that other people have received. One thing that this passage has also done, one of the reasons I come to the defense of Thomas isn't just because he's been judged on his worst day, isn't just because I can really identify with this human being questioning even his best friends. It's this passage gets used frequently by some of our sisters and brothers in other kinds of churches to say, you shouldn't doubt or question your faith. Just believe. Quoting Jesus, do not doubt, but believe. As if questions are the problem. And not to gaslight anybody, including myself, there are religious leaders who will try to make you believe that doubting and questioning is a problem. But that is not the scriptural uh, That is not the scriptural truth. The scriptural truth is grounded in questions. Jesus' own mama, when she was told that she's going to have the baby, went, huh? How? How am I supposed to be doing this? Moses, um, excuse me. (laughs) Just about every prophet named, (laughs) wrong guy. The questions aren't the problem. In fact, questions can be a reflection of the deepest level of love. The deepest form of care. And I can step outside of the church for this. Uh, Relationships. If you've been single in the last 10, 20 years, chances are you thought about dating online. You can Google somebody. You can find out a lot of information about a person, their likes, their dislikes, who, you know, kind of surface level. You can, get, you can ask all these kind of surface level questions, but if you fall in love, you don't suddenly know the deepest parts of that person. You're falling in love is you're asking the real questions, the questions on the far side of knowing, the things that make the person tick. And why? Blessed are those who can do that on the front end. Who have the eyes to see for the deep end of relationships and what it means. Liturgically speaking, liturgically speaking, calendar-wise, I think it's next week. You were, it was announced that I would be your pastor the Sunday after Easter. Right? Right? Most folks, what they wanted to know, like what they found out is, he's young. (laughs) Surface level question, right? Like that's who, that's kind of who I am, right? Oh, he's young, he's married, he's got a couple of kids. That's what you want to know. Those are things to know. One of you, I won't out them because I didn't double check. Because it's COVID, like my last three years of sermons were online went and listened to my sermon on the first Sunday of January 2021. What happened January 6th of 2021? Uh, They wanted to know, they wanted to go to the far end of what this relationship might look like, just to see, right? They're not asking, you know, some of you are just happy I'm handsome. (laughs) Maybe one or two of you were happy I'm handsome. So the questions, I mean, and that's, when it comes to religion, folks, you want to talk about, don't, if you are encountering people who struggle with belief like you believe, who struggle with any kind of belief, There are surface level of questions that get us caught off guard as Christians. But you want to move past that with people. You got to get to the questions on the far side of reason. So, when you're in the room with Thomas, 
right? One of the, there's a couple of things that I want folks to hear in this passage. In particular, one, I think Thomas and the disciples should be a metaphor for church. They really should. One, the disciples in their fear of what's happening in the world around them. They just saw their savior die. They just saw the person they had followed and it would not be a stretch of the imagination that the authorities are gonna turn their attention now on all the followers. In their fear and in their isolation, in their fear they did not turn to isolation. In their fear they turned towards community, to being together and that is where Jesus appeared to the gathered community. And with Thomas not being there, he comes back Sunday night. Jesus has left and he's told he's still there a week later. Thomas is looking the disciples in the face going, nah. No, we saw him. We saw the hands. We saw the wounds. He was, he was, he was here. He walked through the wall. And Thomas is going, nah. And he's still there. If you've experienced the kind of church where, that I've experienced, where questions are met with exclusion, where doubting the narrative of the common people is met with repulsion or exorcism in the kind of the most literal sense, that they're trying to draw you out so that we might have unity of the body. In the first following of Jesus, they do not kick Thomas out. In fact, that place is still a place where Jesus shows up. A church should always have a few people in it who are going, nah. It is the evangelistic witness. It is the growth idea of the church. Now, Jesus does say to Thomas, this is, uh, Jesus does say to Thomas and to everybody, you, or he says to the disciples and Thomas, you believe because you see and blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. That's a message that I think should ring true for anybody who's been fighting for social justice on any front for a length of time. Thomas is, an, uh, Thomas is a great example of the, I didn't know until it happened to me. How many of us know somebody who might have been on the wrong side of history when it comes to LGBTQI plus rights, racial reconciliation, until a family member was suddenly a member of that community. Thomas is like your patron saint for that. Now I see because I see it for myself. And one of the critiques of people who've been in the fight for forever, or born into those communities, why, does it ha why do I have to wait for you to know somebody? Aren't you actually just hearing it? Can't you hear the pains of God's children in a world that is trying to crush them? <laughs> And to that effect, what I say is, one of the reasons having Sunday school, nursery, and children in spaces is that our children might be blessed in ways that we were not. Amen? Because blessed will be our children who don't have to wait. They just grow up in it. The stories of what, what it means to seek justice in our world are just legion in this room. I remember when I came home uh, with the movie The Birdcage, and it had Robin Williams and Nathan Lane, and they were a married couple, and my parents knew the movie, they didn't know I knew the movie. <laughs> and my mom's just like, I just wanna have a conversation when you're done watching it. Because she just wanted to check to see where I was. I'm from rural Minnesota, and I just I was like, eh, it makes sense. I kind of had this 
and my, my parents just were boggled. They're like, you don't, you, you don't think that's weird? You don't think that's different? You don't think that's odd? No, makes sense. Good, oh, thank God. <laughs> they were just so relieved. Meanwhile, my kids are growing up with a book. I mean, they won't need a movie when they're 14, right? My kids, uh, we have a book, um, This or That. Kids who are like, it's about this, uh, I should just plug the book, this or that, and it's uh, ducks or rabbits in a world of this and that, and then a both is born. All right, uh, I'll save that for a good children's sermon, but I'm not just doing it at my home. I'm bringing that to this church so that our kids might be blessed, so that they are blessed in a way that Jesus commends. Blessed are they who have not seen and still believe. But I'm going to need help. You got me? I'm going to need help. Thank you. So, Thomas and the disciples, a church with a space for doubters. We need both. We need that space. And then Jesus shows up. And Jesus is the model. He is... Uh, what's, what's my word? <laughs> he's emblematic of what we're, he's aspirational for us. So frequently we, we're, I think it's very real that we can be the disciples and, Jude, and Thomas in this room. But Jesus is the model of what we are trying to be. Jesus, we are meant to be Jesus to the world. We are trying to be the body of Christ. We're not just supposed to be locked in our rooms amazed that Jesus showed up. We are called to be Jesus to people who don't know him, who don't know this freedom. And how does Jesus meet the questions and doubts of Thomas? He has wounds that no longer hurt. Wounds that are obvious, that are there, and the word for that is a scar. I've got scars. If I think hard enough, and sometimes not that hard, I can remember their pain. And the stories are usually pretty good. Right? That's usually what happens with scars. You get stories, and you can tell that one. Because it doesn't hurt anymore. Christ shows the scars and proclaims from them a, the story of salvation for the whole world. The scars on Jesus' body show all the separation that we have from God and each other. It's almost, it's, it's convicting and challenging that when God showed up, humanity nailed God to the cross. And not look at what you did. But as Jesus shows the wounds, he says, peace. He says, shalom. Not just, don't worry, I'm not going to hurt you. That's the thing about shalom. It's not put, your, put, put the gloves down. It's like harmony. Everything should work together. All parts of human flourishing are moving at once. It is a holistic picture of when Jesus says, look, it's peace. Shalom. I hold, not only do I not hold anything against you, I want you to be fully alive. That, my friends, is the aspiration of the church. I encourage you to preach your scars. It's hard to preach wounds. If you're preaching from your wounds, you're actively bleeding. If I were to tell you what's hurting me now, and I'm not saying that I don't hurt anymore from some things that happened to me five, 10, 20 years ago. I can talk about the previous church that my, not my worst day, <laughs> forgot this. Uh, I was pretty active in a church in high school and two, uh, two daylight savings times in a row, I was late. Like I showed up an hour late, I walked in and I went, oh no. 
And everybody in the church was like, ha, 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 caught me, right? Because I, I was, uh, as loud as my kids are, that's about what I am, like just as a teenager, right? It happened again the following Daylight Savings Time. I, every Daylight Savings Time, I still get messages from members of that church. <laughs> Do you remember when that happened? I'm like, I was in high school. Get new stories. <sighs> Do you get messages every year <laughs> about what you did in high school? I'm not saying it's an open wound, but I can remember that I got that scar on me. And it can go for so much more. Because here's the thing, when you, tell, when you show the scars and you show, when Jesus does this for the whole world, it is a model for us that when we share our scars, the wounds that we have, whether it's from religious trauma, people we've loved and lost, heartbreak, romances that didn't go well, and that you are still here and thriving, it gives, what, it gives to others what Jesus gives to the disciples. It's okay. You are going to be okay. It might be hard. You might, the healing might take some time. But life goes on. There is nothing more when you go through the shattering loss of someone you love. Whether it's the end of a relationship by slam doors and hurt feelings and divorce filings or a death or the betrayal of a leader a country a church there's nothing more chaos nothing more the hardest part is not knowing what tomorrow holds and if you bear a scar that means you've survived it before and that is a healing gift that you can give to another human being this is one of those other aspects of that sermon about testimony. I've made it. It's going to be okay. And so Jesus sends them out. After this, we get kind of the soft close to the chapter. There's a whole other chapter. It's kind of like the post credit scene. For my movie fans, like the next chapter of John, like it ends with, and there was, like I just love how John writes, because it, and Jesus did many other, th other things and it was quite wonderful, the end. You know, like, and then there's the next chapter, right? Like, stayed for the credits, here it comes. But for John, it's, you have this animated body of Christ that of the disciples who have shared with, Th with Thomas that they had seen him. And when Thomas experiences the scars in his hand, he gives a testimony that no other disciple gave. No other witness of Jesus' ministry gives this. And it is the most honest, true, and core pro proclamation, one that we are hoping spreads. My Lord my God because when you know that the future isn't in your hands but in God's when you have the confidence of faith that whatever trials and tribulations face you whatever wounds spiritual emotional or physical will not hold you down because God has set you free from all of it what then is the proper response go out in mission and share that story with everyone. Amen.